Are you tired of making green ears? No, no, not green ears for dinner again. Do you sometimes feel like you can't count on Ostrupen? You can count on Ostrupen. No, really, you can't. Well, then, good news because I have the build order for you. So for the build order, you have your initial Pioneer, then immediately you build a second one, then an MG42, then a second MG42, then upgrade Battle Phase 1 at your headquarters building, then build a Panzer Grenadier, put down your Tier 2 tech structure, and build a 222. The basic idea behind this build order is that since you don't have to build Tier 1, you run out onto the map immediately with your pioneers, leading to much faster territory acquisition at the start of the game. And combined with the resources you saved by not building Tier 1, this means you can push out a light vehicle at a very early timing, which can be tough for your opponent to deal with. I timed 10 of my own games and 10 games from the recent Master League tournaments and the 222 arrived around 1 minute 10 faster with this strategy. Pioneers first because they have a build time of 20 seconds compared to the MG42's 36. This means they'll hit the field and start capping significantly earlier and you generally don't need the firepower of the MG42 during these very early stages of the game. Next up are the double MG42's and these are the backbone of your army. However, I'm not going to lie, this strategy is a bit of a gamble. Sometimes your MG42 positioning can line up well and you can completely dominate your opponent. And other times your machine gun positioning doesn't quite work out. Or maybe you fail to suppress an enemy and then you have a rough early game. So you have to accept those kind of swings if you want to play this strategy. One thing that can help you with your MG42 positioning. Pioneers have a sight range of 42, whereas most other units have a sight range of 35. So this can help you set up your machine gun in a relevant position and catch your opponent unaware. And the extra sight is also helpful for spotting your opponent's flanking attempts. Some of my most successful early games happen when I manage to sneak a MG42 into an aggressive and relevant building. And that can help me lock down around a third of the map and then using my double pioneers to support my other MG42 to control roughly another third of the map. It is also helpful to be aware of how much suppression you applied to each enemy unit. Say you did a short burst and you only just suppressed the enemy squad and then you switch targets or start to reposition the MG42 and you're sending your pioneers into close range to chase off the suppressed squad. The enemy could recover from suppression before the pioneers manage to close the distance and this can be disastrous especially if the enemy is a close range specialist such as assault sections. So for more info on this, you may want to check out my starter series guide on suppression. Your first munitions expenditure during this phase should be a flamethrower for one of your pioneers, generally whichever one is healthier of the two. A telemine is also a good idea if you see a nice opportunity during these early phases. And I have won many a game with this strategy by planting an early teller to knock out my opponent's light vehicle. And since you have double pioneers, you have so many more opportunities to plant these cheeky telemines. Early light vehicles such as the M3A1, Universal Carrier and WC-51 can be a real handful to deal with. So if your opponent has gone for one of these, I would suggest playing a more compact style where your two MGs can support each other. And buildings that have a window in each direction are also a strong option for dealing with these. From here the build order can diverge by quite a lot depending on which commander you select. So let's cover a few of the variations starting out with the strongest Jaeger Infantry. The most important function here is the Jaeger Command Squad, which is a strong all-rounder and has access to the Panzerfaust. Even just having one Panzerfaust makes a huge difference in the strategy, allowing you to be a lot more aggressive with your positioning. Got my Fausting Squad next to my 222 here. Makes it a lot safer without risking a complete collapse, which probably happened in about one out of every eight games against opponents that were close to my skill level if I didn't use the Aegir Command Squad. So this boosts your win percentage by a significant amount. Ambush training, which is great to have on your machine guns, especially if your opponent is using a long sight range unit such as Pathfinders or Pyrotechnics upgraded Tommies, or perhaps the Soviet Mortar Flare and these can cause massive issues for your MG42 positioning. 
So in those cases, you might want to make ambush camo on your machine gun to your first munitions expenditure instead of the Pioneer flamethrower. Once upgraded, ambush camouflage hides your out of combat unit in light or heavy cover. You can also move around in cover and stay camouflaged, though if one model of the squad leaves cover, you will get revealed, so this often isn't very viable in actual gameplay. When you start to fire coming out of camouflage, Panzer Grenadiers have a 50% accuracy bonus for 5 seconds, whereas the other units only get a 25% accuracy bonus. Also note that Grenadiers and the Jaeger Command Squad will get revealed from camouflage when an enemy unit comes within 20 range. Whereas MG42s and Panzer Grenadiers get revealed at 7 range, so their camouflage is much more effective. Since you will often be using one or two squads of ambush camouflage Panzer Grenadiers, I think it's worth covering the best way to execute an ambush with them. The easiest is to set up on a point where the opponent is about to capture next. Ideally, you'll set up with hold fire on, on cover that is outside of the capture circle, but within grenade range of where the enemy will automatically run to with their capture order. This gives you more time to react to the opponent being in position. Because if you are inside the capture circle, they will notice that you are jamming their capture attempts and thus be prepared for a camouflage unit. Then I suggest you initiate by throwing the bundle grenade first, then waiting around half a second or so, and then give the attack command or remove hold fire. This gives you the best chance of connecting with your bundle grenade, which will do the lion's share of damage. If we look at this from the opponent's view, say they are looking at their base at the time, the time from the audio cue of the conscripts starting to shoot, which is probably what I would be most likely to notice, I don't really pay much attention to the alerts on the left hand side of the screen, till the time the conscripts are dead is 1.63 seconds. So this can be tough to avoid as the opponent if you are not watching the engagement directly. Getting back into Jaeger Infantry, you have the G43s, which are a nice option to have on your Panzer Grenadiers. The extra sight the upgrade provides again makes it much easier to position your team weapons, though you will lose a bit of wiping potential in your ambushes. Light Artillery Barrage, which I think is one of the strongest off-maps in the game at the moment because of its low cost and how quickly the shells come down after you activate it. This means that even at the high ranks, players have a hard time dodging away from it in time, making it a strong option to counter team weapons which are also very prevalent at the high levels of play. And finally there is the Stuka Anti-Tank Strafe, I would just forget about this, save your munitions for the light artillery barrage, grenades and telemines, this ability is quite weak because of how slow it comes through, making it very easy to dodge. So the build order after the 222 for Jaeger Infantry, if you're doing well and you think you're going to delay your opponent's light vehicle, go for Jaeger Command Squad into Pack, but if you're doing poorly, go for Pack first into Jaeger Command Squad. And then after that, get your Med Bunker. If you are up against double or triple light vehicles, such as we've seen a lot from USF lately, go for a second pack now. And if you have fallen behind and your opponent is going to get their medium tank out a decent amount before you, this is also a good timing to push out a second pack. If you are doing well in terms of manpower bleed and haven't suffered any wipes, you can often squeeze in a second Panzer Grenadier before taking Battle Phase 2. After Battle Phase 2, put down your Tier 3 tech structure and then build a Panzer IV. And the Panzer IV arrives at roughly the same time as in a standard Osir build. When it comes to the late game, you have two options. You can stay on Tier 3 and spam tanks, or you can tick up to tier 4 and aim for the Panther and the Panzerwerfer. With this commander I'm more inclined to go for the tier 3 tank spam because the light artillery barrage lessens your need for the Panzerwerfer. And the reinforcement cost bonus for having your tier 4 tech structure down does not apply to Panzer Grenadiers or the Jaeger Command Squad, so you don't get as much of a benefit from it as you do with the Grenadier build. If your opponent is using one of the premium medium tanks such as the T-3485 or the EZ-8, they can be tough to beat with the Panzer IV alone, so that is a situation you might want to take up and go for the Panther. Or if your opponent has gone for a lot of infantry based anti-tank and has planted a lot of mines, that is where you might want to go for the Panzerwerfer. I basically never use the Brumbeer with this strategy since your lack of snares make it even more vulnerable to getting flanked, though you could probably still get away with it in a team game. Another commander worth considering with this strategy is Storm, it has a couple of the same tools as Jaeger Infantry in Ambush Training and the Jaeger Command Squad. 
And for its other tools, you have these smoke bombs, which can act as a recon plane, plus the Stuka dive bomb combo, which is great for countering enemy howitzers, as well as a howitzer of your own. So this commander is more suited to team games, where howitzers are more prevalent to fight against and more effective. Another good commander option is German infantry. Here you will be using the 250 that arrives even earlier than the 222, which means it has massive shock impact. So the build order is different. After taking battle phase 1, you start construction of your 250 at your headquarters building. Then put one of your pioneers that's upgraded with the flamethrower inside of it and start getting to work. After that, build a Panzer Grenadier, then your tier 2, and from there you have two options. You can either build a 222 to keep up the light vehicle pressure, or consolidate things by building a pack. The 222 is a good option if you're up against a lower armor light vehicle such as the M20, but if you're expecting to be up against a higher armor light vehicle such as the Stuart or the AEC, the pack is the safer option. Now this build is even more timing reliant than what we've used so far, so if you're late upgrading your Battle Phase 1 or slow starting production on the 250, you should probably consider using a different commander, so I would hold my commander pick until those two conditions were satisfied. So if your 250 is hitting the battlefield after 4 minutes 30, I would say that you have missed the timing window that makes this tactic so effective. This tactic is also significantly less effective against Soviets. Obviously if they've gone tier 1 they can upgrade PTRSs on their penals at any stage and that will severely limit the effectiveness of your 250. If they've gone for conscripts they can take anti-tank grenades. This means that after the initial attack with the 250 you have to assume that they have anti-tank grenades ticked, meaning you can no longer drive into close range safely for fear of getting anti-tank grenaded and this will severely limit the DPS of the squad inside the 250. And with the threat of the URA and anti-tank grenade, this means you have to micro your 250 quite diligently, and the DPS it does from long range simply doesn't justify this kind of attention. Soviets also have the most spammable early mines, and your early light vehicle pressure tends to accelerate the command point clock, meaning they can field their counters such as guards or the M42. So this build is at its strongest against the British forces, who often don't even have a Royal Engineer for snares at this timing, and you can delay the AEC by a considerable amount. And a solid option against US forces, whose anti-tank grenades come online later than Soviets. You remember Italy? And against the more popular Lieutenant build, their anti-tank options are more limited before the Stuart hits the battlefield. You can see that the PTRA's penal takes down the 250 far faster than the Bazooka Lieutenant, illustrating this point. Since the 250 doesn't see much play, I feel it is worthwhile to cover a few of its characteristics so you can get the most out of it during this timing window. In spite of looking quite small in game, the 250 has a target size of 18, which makes it quite easy to hit with anti-tank weapons. It also has just 240 health which makes it quite vulnerable to dying from infantry based anti-tank. However it does have pretty good armour for this class, so it doesn't take much damage from small arms fire. When we take a look at the DPS of the machine gun on the 250, you can see that it is slightly worse than the M3A1, largely because its damage drop off happens at 5 range instead of 10. It loses half of its DPS when firing on the move, which is standard for these type of vehicles. The machine gun on the front arc is nothing special, and it doesn't have any bonuses such as 5 extra range or a rear facing machine gun, so all these factors combined mean you're a bit more reliant on the passenger doing damage when using the 250. Putting a Panzer Grenadier in the 250 is a potent combination, since it allows all four of their high DPS assault rifles to fire from inside. This is sometimes known as the squad wipe half track. This is more commonly seen from the mechanized assault commander, but is actually much stronger with German infantry. First off, you don't have to wait until two command points to deploy it. I was often making this unit combination at around one and a quarter command points. At two command points, you unlock the veteran squad leader upgrade for the Panzer Grenadiers. Once upgraded, the Panzer Grenadiers can repair the 250, making it much easier to use independently. The Panzer Grenadiers also get access to smoke, which is very handy, and they get the Mark Target ability, which increases the received accuracy of the enemy squad by 30%, making them much more likely to get wiped. 
though I probably wouldn't suggest jumping out of the troop transport, activating it and then jumping back in, since it only lasts for 15 seconds. The veteran squad leader upgrade for Pioneers allows them to have an extra model, and given that you went for two Pioneers early, this helps keep them relevant in the mid game. After you've built your pack, call in a squad of Stormtroopers or build some Panzer Grenadiers, build your med bunker and tech up to Battle Phase 2. So now let's dig into Stormtrooper performance so you know when to build them. Stormtroopers unlock at two command points and they have an infiltration spawn ability, meaning you can bring them in from unoccupied ambient buildings on the map. Upon spawning, their incendiary grenade is on cooldown and they start with Car 98K rifles identical to Grenadiers. You can upgrade to their MP40 submachine gun package for free and this takes 15 seconds. So when deploying in a building behind enemy lines, you may want to do it out of the enemy's sight, wait for these upgrades to kick in before making your attack. The Stormtrooper MP40s do great damage up close, but that falls away quickly between 10 and 20 range, and beyond 20 range they do nearly nothing. They also do 51% of their DPS moving when compared to stationary, which isn't that good for submachine guns. Comparing the MP40 to the Thompson that paratroopers and rangers have, the Thompson is near identical at close range, but maintains its DPS out to a much longer range. The Thompson also does 54% of its DPS moving when compared to stationary. So from this weapon profile, you can see that Stormtroopers are not well suited to charging in from long range over open ground. They don't do enough damage as they are closing the distance from 35 to 15 range, so by the time they get into close range, they are often too wounded to win the fight and they are not strong enough to win the head-to-head -head against the other close-range specialists. Instead, Stormtroopers need to be used as an ambush squad. You can use their camouflage to make sure that all of the engagements start at close range where they are at their strongest, and ideally try to target isolated squads that are weak at close range. To achieve this, you need to have a good understanding of how their camouflage works, which is different to the Panzer Grenadiers with ambush camouflage that we covered earlier. Stormtrooper camouflage lasts for three and a quarter seconds after they exit cover, whereas a sniper's camouflage only lasts for two and a quarter seconds after exiting cover. This extra second allows the Stormtroopers to cover an extra five range before being revealed. So even though it is more cumbersome to move a full model squad around in cover trying to keep them camouflaged, the extra cloak time more than makes up for this and allows you to cross some gaps in cover that snipers cannot. For the squad to go into camouflage and stay camouflaged, more than half of the squad has to be in cover. So at full strength, three out of four models need to be in cover for the camouflage to work. When the squad is down to three models, only two need to be in cover, and then when the squad is down to two models, both of them need to be in cover for camouflage to be active. Stormtroopers will be revealed from their camouflage when an enemy comes within seven range. So you can typically sneak into very close range before springing your ambush. However, Stormtroopers do not gain any accuracy bonuses when they start to fire coming out of camouflage. This is where the ability Tactical Advance comes into play. It massively increases their burst length and boosts up their accuracy, causing their DPS to skyrocket, making it very easy to get squad wipes. However, it also increases the Stormtrooper's received accuracy by 50%, making them very vulnerable to return fire, which is why this is best used against an isolated squad so the Stormtroopers don't take too much damage. It also makes the Stormtroopers move far slower, meaning they can have a hard time chasing down retreating squads, and these penalties continue to apply even when the Stormtroopers are retreating, so you need to be cautious about when you activate it. I found Stormtroopers to be most effective against the British forces, brained up infantry sections are powerhouses long range, but quite weak up close, so sneaking up to them with the Stormtroopers is very effective. The incendiary grenade is very good against trenches, and the Stormtroopers can also be pretty good against Snipers. And I found Stormtroopers to be the least effective against Soviets, 
The six-man squads and weapon teams were a bit too much health to chew through when going for an ambush, which results in less wipes. They tend to spam mines and losing two stormtrooper models is very expensive to reinforce. And against Soviets I found the explosive impact of the Panzer Grenadier's bundle grenade to be much more useful than the damage over time from the incendiary grenade. And for the German infantry late game, it is basically the same as the Jaeger infantry late game that we covered earlier, except now you use fragmentation bombs against their team weapons instead of the light artillery barrage. The last variation of this build that I'm going to cover is with the elite troops commander. It has the usual start, but after the first 222, you build a second 222. Going double 222s is a solid option with all of these builds, however it is most necessary with elite troops. Since you don't have the option of getting a snaring squad, the double 222s can help you out a lot against your opponents like vehicle pressure, especially on the larger maps where it can be difficult to rotate your anti-tank gun from one side to the other. And you have Panzer Tactician in this commander, which makes keeping the double 222s alive a much easier task. So now let's examine how the double 222s perform against some of their allied light vehicle counterparts. The double 222s win quite handily against the quad and even beat the T-70, though typically one of them will die in the process. So I do like going for the double 222s against Soviets even though their supporting anti-tank is quite strong. The double 222s also beat the US forces anti-air half-track though not by as big of a margin as you might expect. So ideally you would start your attack while the half-track is reloading or when it is forced to move away so that only the machine guns are firing. The double 222s perform very well against the Greyhound which is quite lightly armoured. However in the head-to-head -head against the Stuart which has quite strong frontal armour here the 222s can struggle. And when you factor in the Stuart's abilities such as Shell Shock, the Bazooka on the Lieutenant, 50 cal AP ammo and a couple snares from the Rifeman, this can be a really tough matchup for the double 222s. Against the AEC, the double 222s are slightly favoured to win, however the AEC also has access to smoke and I believe this tips the engagement in favour of the AEC. From inside the smoke, the AEC can attack ground, move while it's reloading and then attack ground again, making it quite hard to hit. Whereas the 222 needs to stay in place for a bit over two and a half seconds to fire off all of its rounds before it can move again. So this makes it a lot easier to target in the attack ground smoke wars. The 222 doing its damage over five hits instead of one hit does have an advantage however. You end up being very likely to cause a main gun crit on your opponent's vehicle when it gets below 25% health. Since the 222 has 40 penetration at all ranges, don't feel you need to close the distance on the enemy light vehicle to try and boost up your chance to penetrate. Though of course getting onto the rear of the high armor targets such as the Stuart and the T-70 can be very advantageous. For the rest of the elite troops commander you have the stun grenades which really help out the stormtroopers when you have to go head to head against another close range specialist. If you use grid keys do be aware that the stun grenade rather stupidly moves hold fire from S up to E. And with the panzer grenadiers you can lead with the stun grenade since it is cheaper and maybe bait out a retreat or see which direction they dodge towards and then throw the bundle grenade there since the stun nade and the bundle grenade are on different cooldowns. You have the G43s and you can upgrade the G43s after you have already upgraded the MP40s on your stormtroopers. This is handy because if you are behind it can be difficult to find time to sneak into close range with the camouflage on your stormtroopers. So the G43s allow you to use them in a more head on role. The stormtroopers retain their camouflage and even though you don't get an ambush bonus they're still pretty decent at killing snipers from mid to long range. And for the late game you have the Tiger Ace which is a very powerful tank, however do remember you need to have your tier 4 tech structure constructed to be able to call it in. And combined with the extra 80 manpower it costs over the regular Tiger, this makes the Ace quite a lot more difficult to stall for. So now you know three different styles for the double pio WMG start. Overall I found this build to be very fun and a nice change of pace from the three or four mainline infantry starts that we see from every faction. 
It also gives you a lot of opportunities to practice your MG42 positioning. Though it is a bit of a glass cannon build, if things don't quite line up with your MG42 positioning, you can struggle. And not having access to snares all over the map can make things quite a lot more difficult. If you'd like to contribute to my airfare for heading over to the GCS3 tournament, donation and Patreon links are down below.